Well, good We're evening. We're the show on the road. <laughs> God bless, Kate. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the original Fearless Girls of Advertising. I'm Jackie Kelly, and on behalf of myself and Kim and Devika, we are delighted to be your host tonight. These incredibly accomplished leaders um, did us a tremendous favor. They showed us what was possible. They demonstrated in an industry led by men that women could dominate, <laughs> right? Yes. They focused on the work. They ignored the bias. They kept an incredible sense of humor, which you're going to see tonight. And they found wonderful joy in the journey that required a lot of perseverance. And through that, they did us a tremendous favor in that they gave us someone to look up to, which is what tonight's about. In the audience, we're super excited about the mix of who's in here. We have wonderful male allies. I see you, your advocates for the diversity and inclusion we want in this industry. We also have young men and women who different organizations selected because we know you are the future of this industry. And we want tonight to be a bit of inoculation of inspiration um, from what came before. And then there's lots of us, like the three of us, who have been at this for a bit, uh, but never want to lose sight of the responsibility that we have to be the same examples to others that these amazing women were to us. So you're going to hear from them, and I think a lot of you know a bit about them, but I just want to give you a sense of some of their firsts. And I want to warn you, I'm just going to tell you what one of their firsts, and there's a litany or a list of many, many things that follow. So Charlotte Beers was the first female CEO of Ogilvy & Mather. Nina DeSassa was the first chief creative officer and chairman of a large New York agency, My Home McCann. Um, we have Shelley Lazarus, who's the first female to receive the Columbia Business School Distinguished Leader Award. We have Daisy Esposito, who was the first female CEO of the Weinars Bravo Group. We have Kathy Black, who was the first female publisher of USA Today. And last but not least, we have Carol Williams, who was the first African-American creative director of Leo Burnett. Uh, so we're going to hear... I woke, up, uh, I woke up this morning and I had a pretty self, high self-esteem day, but when, you, <laughs> when you're with these women, it's amazing how that can come down uh, pretty fast. But what I do also want to talk about is just really quick that while we're going to hear from these real-life fearless girls, we do have um, a great client, where are you, Stephen, from State Street Global Advisors to create the symbol of Fearless Girl. And as she stands downtown, as a reminder to all of us that the more women we have in leadership, the better it is for business, right? This is not just a good thing. And it's not just a good thing from a numbers perspective. It's actually good for business. So our hope for today is to acknowledge where we currently are, to celebrate how far we've come, and to light a fire under all our asses as we go forward together. So there are many thank yous, and it takes a village to put something like this together. I'd like to thank the New York Women in Communications Organization, the American Advertising Federation, who, as always, do so much to celebrate diversity in our industry. So thank you both very, very much. And I know there's many representatives here. And to Devika and her incredible team at McCann, they're the best. They pulled this whole thing together. Oh, and yeah. <laughs> with um, our incredible hosts, Jackie Kelly and Bloomberg Media, it's, it's really, this is, this is a different kind of event. This is not, um, this is a labor of love event. Nobody sells sponsorships. No one's, <laughs> no one sells sponsorships. And this is just, this was just an idea that actually came through um, to realization because of these two ladies. So. And a cocktail. And several cocktails. <laughs> it's amazing what happens over a cocktail. <laughs> so I have the pleasure of introducing our moderator this evening. She is a renowned author and producer of many, many books, um, including Together We Rise, which was the story of the making of the Women's March. She is the longtime editor-in-chief of Self and Glamour magazines. She has a huge voice and is a powerful advocate on behalf of women absolutely everywhere. So please join me in warmly welcoming Cindy Levy. Okay, perfect. 
Hi, everybody. Um, as they say in wrestling, welcome to a night of legends. Um, I actually have no idea if they say that in wrestling, but I feel like they must. Um, I am really, really honored to be here with the incredible women that you heard about. Um, so although a proper recitation of their CVs would go on for hours because they are awe-inspiring. I'm going to try to get through it quickly so that we can all hear everything that they have to say. Um, our first panelist is Kathy Black. You heard that she um, spent time as the first female publisher of USA Today, but before that she had been the first woman publisher of a consumer weekly, New York Magazine. She was also the ad director of Ms. Magazine, the feminist magazine back in the 1970s. She then went to Hearst Magazines where she served as president and then chairman. Um, and as somebody who spent much of their career at Condé Nast, she was always the one to beat, um, although you rarely did. <laughs> Her book is called Basic Black. Um, it's a manual of advice and counsel for women as they come up in both their professional and their personal lives. Please welcome Kathy Black. <laughs> Sorry, it's a long walk across that stage. <laughs> welcome, Kathy. Thank you. Our next panelist is Nina DeSessa. Um, you heard that she was the first woman creative director of a major New York ad agency, um, McCann. Um, she then went on, as one does, to become chairman and chief creative officer, again, as the first woman. Um, her book, because you have to have one to appear on this stage, <laughs> is called Seducing the Boys Club. Please welcome Nina DeSessa. Clapping, she's still walking. <laughs> Our third panelist is Charlotte Beers. Um, you heard about her career of firsts. In addition to being the first woman to appear on the cover of Fortune, she was also the former chairman and CEO of Ogilvy and Mather, for the first woman um, to run a global, a top ten global ad agency. Um, we have so many firsts on this panel, that is a really important one to recognize. Um, her book is called I'd Rather Be in Charge. Um, she <laughs> additionally served as Under Secretary of State under President George W. Bush. Um, Harvard teaches a class based on her tenure. I'm not joking. Apparently, it's called Charlotte Beers at Ogilvy. Um, and fun fact, apparently, she once actually, well, she'll tell me if this is true, Apocryphally, it's said that she ate dog food during a pitch while pitching a product, and I am certain she won. Please welcome Charlotte Beers. Our next panelist is Carol Williams. As you heard, she's the first female and first black creative director and vice president at Leo Burnett. She is also the founder of Carol H. Williams Advertising, which she launched from her living room. And this was the days before everybody was doing a startup. She did it. And here, three decades plus later, um, it exists in four cities around the country um, and is thriving. Um, she also wrote, and maybe some in the room who are of a certain age will say it along with me, the famous line from the secret antiperspirant commercial, strong enough for a man, but made for a woman. Thank you, and please welcome Carol Williams. Our next panelist is Daisy Exposito Ula. She is the chairman and CEO of De Exposito and Partners. And before that, as you heard, she ran the Bravo Group, which under her leadership became the largest US Hispanic agency of all time. Um, she's Cuban American. She has said that she learned English from watching I Love Lucy, and she has become one of the industries. I don't see anything wrong with that. Um, and she she has become one of the industry's strongest 
Voices for Inclusion. Please welcome Daisy Exposito Ula. I'm doing the most abbreviated versions of these bios. Um, our final panelist, and then we will get to our conversation, is Shelley Lazarus, a woman who may need no introduction, but I will do it anyway. She is the Chairman Emer Emeritus of Ogilvy & Mather, where for over 40 years, she went from being one of the only women in the room to being the woman running the show. Um, she held the top job for close to 15 years. Um, we are honored to have the inspiration and voice of Shelley and all of our panelists here with us tonight. So please welcome Shelley Lazarus. Thank you, ladies. Um, I think my job here is to get out of the way so that we can hear from all of you. But I want to start us off by talking about the word that is in the title of this panel, Fearless Girls of Advertising. I admit that I don't relate much to the word fearless because I've been scared almost every day of my working <laughs> life. And so I'd like to hear from each of you whether you relate to that term and if you can recall moments when you were afraid or when you felt fearless. Um, so Shelley, let's start with you. Sure, well, I, I'm sort of with you, Cindy. It's just sort of, I'm, uh, I, I, I was afraid every day. I still say, uh, there's a hall in the Savoy Hotel that I walked down, and I remember being there the sort of my first uh, uh, meet, set of meetings when I was um, the chief operating officer. I had sort of never, really traveled abroad and here I was with a lineup of like uh, eight English CEOs you know who talked like they sounded so smart and you know <laughs> sophisticated and and so I was just terrified I was completely terrified mm -hmm. and I can still I, I still like to feel it as I walk down those halls because you know I, I then remember sort of how far I came but um, th that I had come but um, I actually, I used to think fear was a bad thing, and I've come to know that it's a really good thing because it's sort of a, a sign that you're doing really new things, that you're really being challenged, that you're learning, and you just kind of accept it as sort of part of, okay, here's a totally, totally new experience. Yeah. So I, I also think that most of the time I was too dumb to know to be afraid. <laughs> and so that worked too. Just, uh, <laughs> Cluelessness can be a good career right, strategy, right. although I doubt you ever were. What about the rest of you? Do you well, relate we, we to that? We were paid too? so little, how could we be that fearful? <laughs> <laughs> there wasn't that much to lose. <laughs> But you didn't have that sense of, oh my gosh, I'm the only woman in the room, I have to tread so carefully? I always was very conscious of being the only woman in the room, mm -hmm. which you know certainly happened to everybody in this room as well. But I think over time, the fear leads to confidence building. And you can have that fear, but when you kind of overcome it, then you begin to build your own self-confidence. And I think that's something that a lot of younger women um, appreciate thinking that there's a there's a there's a, a road out of fear into feeling more confident and building that skill set mm -hmm. and feeling pretty good about that. So I have a story about uh, both of those things. I I hit a wall once, and it's sort of fortunately in the early part of my career between fear and fearlessness, and I was master of the work at J. Walter Thompson, hot stuff. I didn't know there was such a difference between work and relationships. And I left Thompson to take a middle-sized agency with great clients and be a CEO. Slam dunk. The problem was I was scared to death from the day I walked in the door. And what frightened me was uh, kind of logical. The creative department was fond of drugging and drinking. The financial <laughs> system didn't work. And it turns out that for me, these were utterly fearful things. I don't know if they would be for everyone. My family was uneven about money. My father was an alcoholic. This is not my idea of a good time. I went to work for security and because it seems so safe. I've heard so many women call work safe. Ha. But once you get there, you have to deal with the game. So I was taking another job, an easier job, a lower level job, really, out the door. 
and I turned over some pages of anonymous reviews that we were doing for one another, and it said, Charlotte is fearless. And I thought, oh yeah. <laughs> and then I realized another one came up and said, she's really brave for us in front of the client. I thought, that's different, and there is that Charlotte. So what I did is I decided to stay, and I went to work on this other side of me that was so fearful. So I attended Children of Alcoholics. I, am, I have a degree in math. I know how to do numbers. Why didn't I look at them? Well, I began to look at them. And over time, we turned that company around. And I got a chance to create a different threshold for myself as a CEO in waiting. And I think that the message for me to you is <clears throat> don't give up on yourself. I almost did. And if you understand that there are two or three of you hanging in there, and the one that you want out is the one that's going to be propelled by a deeper understanding of what you have to offer, and also um, that fear is just this great impetus to shove you out in the world where you may not find everything welcome, but all will be fascinating. Mm -hmm. I, think I, think. Nice. I think the fear is an absolutely necessary thing. You can imagine me, a 20-year-old African-American woman from the south side of Chicago, when I got promoted. I was the only woman and the only African-American in this firm. Everybody under me was white males. Scared the hell out of me. Mm -hmm. It was very, very frightening. And as I remember the feeling of first giving my first directive I wondered if they were going to do what I said. That was a very, very, very poignant, incredible moment that turned my life around. Because guess what? They did. They did it. <laughs> <laughs> and so you, as you grow and you mature, you recognize that fear is really a figment of imagination, who you are. What's inside of you? You have to always remember that fear is coming inside of you. And it's there really to make you a stronger person. Because once you step through it, once you break through it, you become stronger, you become more confident and more commanding. And you can get it done. You can imagine, have, as we all did, putting our stuff out there. Will people like it? Oh my God, that's a fearful moment. Mm -hmm. And then guess what? The audience responds. So I was talking to my brother about it one time, and he said, that's everybody's companion, from that monster un under your bed to that soldier walks on the field, everyone's scared, to that basketball player that has to shoot that ball in front of millions of people. That's the maker. You don't become a leader without feeling it many times. Mm. Can, can I just add something? Because I, I worked for Charlotte for five years. Uh, and I, I never saw a moment of fear. But, but what, what I want to add is it is so, so confidence building to go in next to someone who is confident, is sure, you know, that that this meeting is going to be successful and we're going to do what we need to do. And sort of when Charlotte stood tall, I stood tall. Mm -hmm. And so having someone beside you or, you know, above you who you can look up to, who has this kind of command and belief makes all the difference. <laughs> and by the so same. thank you, Charlotte, for the... <laughs> Am I crying? I yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's beautiful because it was beautiful. also the the re, you're reading someone else's review no, but of I, you. I, that... have, I have another um, addendum to that. When I was offered the improbably offered the job of Ogilvy, and I had almost no qualifications actually. <laughs> and you know, the McKinsey study says when women think they don't have any qualifications, they say no, and men say I can do it even mm -hmm. if they don't. Right. So we got to learn that trick. So I was busy learning it. I didn't have a lot of things. So I asked to speak to the head of New York, which, can you believe my luck was a woman? And so Shelly and I are talking, and I'm, I'm trying to understand even the questions to ask. And Shelly interrupts me and says, if you come to Ogilvy, I'll support you. And I have to say, I decided to go at that moment. How can you beat a story like that? Now, that's fearless, isn't it? 
with no known sure thing. You know, I, I, I just want to say, I, I never yeah. worked for a woman, ever. And um, yeah. I, I tried to be a good woman <coughs> for other people. But I, I remember being, you know, we were all scared because, you know, it's the advertising business, <laughs> the scary business. It's crazy. <laughs> and I remember, I remember saying to the men who went to McCann, uh, on the rare occasion when they would be honest with me about something, I'd say, aren't you guys scared? Look at what we're up against. And they would go, Pfft. Of course they're scared, but we don't want anyone to see it. And I, I thought that was really smart. You know, you can pretend that you're not scared. And after a while, it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. If you pretend that you're not scared long enough and with enough passion, pretty soon you won't be scared. It never quite happened to me. I never quite got the don't be scared area, but I was pretty good at pretending that I wasn't scared. Or, you know, that line, don't let them see you sweat. Yeah, absolutely. And so it's what's on the inside that... Yeah, right. But I, I learned a lot from the men I worked with. Yeah, yeah. we all do. We yeah. All do. I, I, we're coming back to that, <laughs> definitely. Yeah. Daisy, I want to hear about your I've fearless been moments. all my life. Mm -hmm. Right? I came from Cuba when I was 10. I was scared to come here. I was scared not to speak English. I was scared when I walked into YNR and I was, wow. you know, mm -hmm. accepting a position as creative director that I didn't think I was qualified for, but my husband said, you can do it, you can do it. Mm -hmm. And fast forward 10 years after being there, I was running the company. And after, you know, being somewhat successful and almost, you know, we were growing very fast and we had a mission and so on and so forth. And NAFTA comes along. And again, it was, you know, an all male board. I was several, several steps removed. What I represented, the Hispanic market, was really low priority. There were like 20 million Latinos at the time. Today there are 60. We're still not the priority, but at least we're part of the conversation. And someone said, we're going to merge uh, Bravo with Latin America. Right. And I said, well, this doesn't make sense. No one's asked me for my opinion. I've been doing this. And so in a very fearful way, um, I said, I can't, you know, I have to speak up. And I think that that's another lesson. I think you need to really voice how you feel and then depends on what happens, you make your decision. <clears throat> but I was vocal. I found someone who happened to be a woman at YNR New York who helped me. She said, you have to put a, a, a business plan together. I did. And it, they took it to my boss who in turn said, you know what? The decision I think is made but the board would like to hear you. Mm -hmm. And someone said, the odds are, you know, don't, don't keep your hopes up. But the truth is that after being very scared, my knees were like maracas <laughs> running, <laughs> running to the meeting and all this impressive group of guys that I had really no contact with. And after presenting my plan, um, and they were all very pokered face, uh, 24 hours or 48 hours later, I was told your plan was approved. We're going to separate Bravo into a separate company from YNR New York. It'll be a company with in Young and Ruby Cam. You know, I was promoted, and I guess that marked my career and probably the path of Hispanic marketing in America. Mm -hmm. So, without the fear and overcoming that fear. <laughs> I wouldn't be sitting here today. Mm -hmm. So that's just an example that happened many years ago, but I can, I have stories and stories of stories of just overcoming that fear right. to succeed. You and everybody on this stage have had a role in really redefining how we see leaders, right? You know, we all have the image of what a leader in any, any industry looked like, often the sort of, you know, strong jawed, tough, pull yourself up by the bootstraps type. and. Certainly in advertising, there's a very clear image of what it used to be. Um, I'm curious what traits each of you feel you relied on the most in the path to get where you are today. I was manipulative. This <laughs> <laughs> is a woman who used the word seduce in her book, yeah. so you know. I know, but I, I, I didn't see anything wrong with being manipulative if you were doing it for the greater cause, for the greater good. Now, I think it's wrong to be manipulative just for your own sake, but I never 
did that. I, I was always doing it uh, to help the agency and sometimes to help them, you know, be better men, be better, you know, be better at what they did, be better women. And so manipulation was not a dirty word for me at all. Give me an example of manipulation. Okay, so, so there would be two guys who wouldn't talk to each other, wouldn't work together and they were causing a problem. And I won't tell you which agency it was because it happened in all of them. <laughs> and so, so I would say to one of them, gee, I'm surprised you don't like Fred because he, he just he said, you. he <laughs> thought the report that you wrote on Baba Bob was really, and what he actually said was it doesn't stink like he normally does it. But I kind of spin it around. He said that he thought your report on whatever you were doing was really smart. He said, really, he said that? I go, yeah, he said that. Well, I kind of like him too because I, he's not that bad. I, so I go to the other guy, I say, gee, you know, so-and-so just told me that he thought you were really smart. And he was, he was sorry that the two of you didn't work more closely together. <laughs> I've got, I've got they one. believe me. You know? I know. I would believe you. Yeah, they want to believe you. I want you to work with me on that one. Manipulation <clears throat> works. What's so, wrong with that? There's nothing wrong with that. Really. <laughs> and nothing wrong with seduction, as you Either, books. yeah. Although you're not allowed to say that today. Well, but it wasn't sex when, seduction. When I was at Ogilvy, <laughs> we're also and coming back to that. <laughs> we were in a very cerebral organization. If you don't believe me, you're going to ask Shelley. So there was not, everybody had a rule for everything. I didn't know any of these rules, and I'm from Texas. So I decided that I needed to meet the clients in a hurry. And the idea was six people would go talk to six people, and two years later, you'd find out something. And we didn't have two years. So there were 30 clients around the world that were key and beautiful clients to me. I'd come from client zero zone. And I called them on the phone. I asked to speak to them personally. I knew my accent and my voice would be something hard to forget. Maybe not good, but hard to forget. And I managed to get a one-on-one -on -one appointment with every CEO I call. And I deliberately said, I would really like to meet with you alone which actually is pretty provocative, isn't it, Nina? <laughs> and so uh, in that conversation, if it went well, I said, what keeps you awake at night? And I got this amazing range of information. Now, everyone is mad. All the brand managers are mad, and all the client groups are foaming at the mouth, and the, and the CEOs had to go down the hall and find out all the things we did wrong. And I don't let him talk about that, so you have to be good at managing the conversation. Mm -hmm. But I came home, even though it was a rule breaker, with treasures because I had current state-of-the-art information about what would work. And I kind of erased this limitation I had about not being a multinational. And I know for a fact that we women don't know the rules. Even now, we say, what are you talking about? Is that the rule? I don't like the rules. So break the rules. Mm -hmm. That is a very useful trait. So rule breaking, manipulative. We're <laughs> I, I want to do passion because it's sort of it's. Uh, I think the ability to sort of express how strongly you feel about exactly. something mm -hmm. with emotion. I mean, if you're going to lead, you got to you know sort of get people to follow you, and they look at in your eyes and they see light in your eyes, and that you're a believer. Then they come and follow you. Now, this gets very tricky, though, right? Because sometimes I have uh, seen women been taken aside by very well-meaning men who say to them, that was good, but you have to be, you know, you have to be a little bit more presidential. You know, you have to be a little bit more cerebral. You mm. just, well, I just say that's, that is just wrong mm -hmm. because people find people of passion compelling. Mm -hmm. They want to be with them. They want to work with them. They want to believe them. And so I just think it's absolutely yeah. essential yeah. if you're going to I don't leave. know anything about passion. I got <laughs> <laughs> Never. Ask for folks who've worked with me. me never. <laughs> Carol, what about you? Well, you know, that's a, it's, I, Everyone has said everything that I feel in terms of the passion, the manipulation. But more importantly, be a woman. Be a woman. Don't be afraid to be a woman. We have all of that. And we're smart. We can see them. We gave birth to them. <laughs> <laughs> We know that, you know, it, uh, I'll bring up a subject, they used to say to me, Carol, how, do you deal, how did you deal with, deal with sexual harassment? 
I sexually harassed them before they could sexually harass me. Uh-oh. Okay, explain. Okay. <laughs> Let's walk through that a little more slowly. It was. <laughs> it was. It's I, what you say mm -hmm. to them, you have to have the courage to have a sense of humor mm -hmm. and to be able to manage it. It's like one day one guy said, I had a dream about you last night, Carol. I said, that'll cost you $1,000. <laughs> hey, he, he was so stunned, I was gone before he could close his mouth. <laughs> you see, it's about being able to manage the situation that you're in. You have an incredible sense of humor. You can see them coming. You know what you see. Mm -hmm. And you know how to move and manage it. What you want to engage in, engage in. But have the power to know, the power, that it is your decision whether or not you want to be in that situation. Manage the situation. Because they, and see, but I think a lot that helped me again is that I was mysterious. They didn't know who we were at that time. We were so few of us in there. Mm -hmm. So as a result, we had better access and our ability to manage the situation. You have to have vision. You have to be able to see. It's, a ch it's very, very difficult. I would not recommend this industry to everyone. Mm -hmm. This is a difficult industry. You, you're not going to avoid it. And this in industry is still owned by, not owned by us. Mm -hmm. It is not. So consequently, it is a problem-solving industry on every level, just not on the paper you do, but on your social engagements. You have to be cognizant of that at all times. Let's stay on that for a, a minute, that idea of the industry not being owned by us. Um, how do you feel we're doing in terms of progress? We're in the middle of this huge cultural discussion about better representation of women and more women in leadership across all industries. You know, looking at the industry that you all know so well, advertising, are we celebrating? Are we close to celebrating? Are we nowhere near? Where are we? Well, I teach executive women, so I have a shot at something in WPP, not the world, but someplace. Around, and what? And we're getting, an, um, like, after 10 years, and Shelly's taking care of and pushing them through the thresholds. We're over there pushing. We have a number of women who are already in these big divisions and making things happen. And what you hear and see, what I see in the template of a man and a woman working together is men, women have, this is really what Carol's talking about, women are not afa afraid of the emotional context of something, of feelings and emotions. And that's why Shelley says, get out there and express yourself. Well, you got punished for that in the past. You looked like you were having a tear run down, men would flee. And I, the most people I've ever seen crying are men, anyway. So <laughs> I don't know what the problem is. So in addition to the emotional content and the intimacy with which our business thrives, the, the unknown of an idea, these are very feminine, intuitional kind of things. The men are great problem solvers. There is nothing like the team together. And what happens when you see the women in these universes that we're really seeing happen, and I know they're not enough, it's just double up. It's double sum game because a woman has a far seeing eye. So for instance, she'll tell you what they really meant. And the man will say, here's what we ought to do about it. You can't beat that team. Mm -hmm. let's, do, let's get that team on. Which is what happens when as, as we break down these barriers, so it's not five guys and one woman, mm -hmm. yeah. unless she's a very, uh, unless she just really lets herself loose, you know, it's intimidating. I mean, I think we have to acknowledge that. Yeah. And so if you have two of this and three of that, or some <laughs> combination, then you're going to have better ideas, better execution, a better conversation, and it's not just going to be one person's idea, mm -hmm. and that everybody has to kind of fall in line. Right. Um, you know, and because I've, I've worked for people like Rupert Murdoch, um, which was, you know, certainly as a young not that young, but I was probably in my mid-30s then. Um, he, he gave me some very good, I, there were two things that I remember about Rupert one time. I was, rep, I was uh, giving a presentation about New York Magazine's year, year to the board. It was a very small board, like five or six people. It wasn't all that formal. But I, with passion, sold the year that we had had. <laughs> and I, was like, I felt like I had worked on it so this. hard. And my boss came in the next morning and he said, Kathy, I'm gonna give you some very good advice. And I'm thinking like, a raise. 
<laughs> and he said, you just kind of, you were selling too hard. I was totally <clears throat> crushed. Yeah. I couldn't yeah. believe that I had done so well, and this man is going to take that sort of sense of excitement and, and feeling like you really did a good job away from me. And then I thought, well, that's his problem. Mm. And I said, Marty, I thought I did a really good job. But it did teach me one lesson, and that is you can oversell in certain situations. Mm -hmm. And I think you have to kind of judge the audience, and there are places to promote and to sell, and there's pl places to not do that as effectively. Mm -hmm. Especially like that was not a corporate boardroom in right. the tradition of, the, of it. But I love that story because that's just practice. Just start practicing. Yep. What are they going to do, kill you? <laughs> Get out there, take a chance, say something outrageous, go too far, and have someone say you went too far. I'd rather go too far than not be heard. Yes. And, mm -hmm. and yep. you know, stamp your foot. Shelly talks about passion. You should see her on a roll. It's shameful what happens <laughs> to the rest of the men. And it's not just verbal agility. She will bring in her doctors, her husband, her children, <laughs> the world, whatever it takes. And so uh, you know you're in the game. You got skin in the game. Get skin in the game and let the consequences take on. Mm. What will emerge is a very superior form of human behavior. Mm. But I think I like one, of the, one of the big differences now, though, from the time when we first started out is our clients are women. I mean, you know, which was They're never true. Crowd, we used too. to, you know, we used to walk into a room of these, you know, serious looking men and all that. It's just, it's just different yeah. now. Mm -hmm. yeah. And the conversation is different. I mean, who ever thought that you could go shoe shopping with your clients? You know, <laughs> now, now you can. Yep. Just, uh, <laughs> but, but I do, but I think it changes the whole nature mm -hmm. uh, of the relationships, of what's happening in these rooms. And it's just, it's just a different conversation. Right. You know, I, I always say, I always like to say, one of my favorite, one of my most memorable, um, uh, moments was Kimberly Clark, makers of uh, sanitary products and diapers, had no women in in the whole company. It's just sort of so when someone had to talk about having a period, that was always me, and it was just sort. Of, and, and you know, it was so bizarre. You knew it was bizarre as you were having this conversation, sort of. And, and well, better you than they talking well, about. Well, it. they did. No, 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 they did. One of my favorite lines was a man said, "Well, you know, we could we could position a period in a different way. We could position it as um, wait, wait for it." Um, the promise of fertility coursing <laughs> through your body. This is a direct quote from somebody who's just a, the a man. The promise of fertility and I, coursing and through I your said, body. And I said, you obviously have never had a period. <laughs> <laughs> but that was one of my favorite stories. I love that story. I, one of my first jobs at Leo, when I went to work at agency was, you know, I put, got put on this feminine hygiene product. And it was, you know, a sanitary pad. You remember, man, you know, older people. It was that pad that had the, the, string, the thing up here and the thing down there, and you hooked it over the, 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 the stuff. And, and they sent me in this room with all these creative men. So here I go, this woman, and I walk in the room. It's 13 men in the room, and they're working on a sanitary pad. <laughs> And I'm like, and you, you look at, it. and they said, okay, here's the board over here, Carol. And so they had personified this pad <laughs> and, 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 and as a woman. And, and the top thing was her hair. <laughs> and the bottom thing was the fishtail dress. And she had two spindly legs coming out and heels on and big red lips. I was like, she got red lips, okay. Uh, and, and, and then they, and the thing was moving, it was dancing. And they said, and they said, I, I used to, they thought it was great. How do you like that, Carol? And I, it's moving. <laughs> and they were like, yeah, it's got legs. It, no, it can't move. <laughs> but it's got, yeah, we, it shows the agility. To, <clears throat> it can't move. <laughs> Of course, they, nobody listened to me, <laughs> and they put that thing in test dancing. Oh my God! And the women just like get that man. <laughs> <laughs> it was a ridiculous. I was like, but that, yeah. but it gave. But guess what? It was one of my biggest opportunities because they had to come back to me, and that's when I created Hey 
are you a new freedom lady? <laughs> and the pad didn't move. <laughs> Brilliant. Um, we have a lot of men, I can see out there, some really great male allies in the audience. So what would you on this panel like to share with them about what they could be doing to encourage the next generation of women who could be up here someday? That's one reason I wanted to come. Because um, I realize, and we've talked about this a lot, women reach this certain threshold, and what we know we need is that top, that push over the threshold. So what is limiting us from getting to that threshold is that the men who are still making judgments about that do not know how to realize our potential. Because the potential is something you haven't done yet. We know what you can do day to day. So we are locked and loaded. We do a great job. It's not enough. You have to teach the men how large, how big, how unlimited your potential is. Well, what's the ammunition you have for that? Well, one of the things other than your own way of talking about yourself and explaining it and holding yourself is that men need to be very clear that they're dealing with a different but remarkable resource. And I would like to ask the men to be better researchers. Don't lay in a template of male behavior on top of a woman. Spend, don't, don't give up on us. Spend enough time with us to say, you actually know me. And you know why you don't? Because we don't play golf with you. We don't do all this stuff. And then you actually are now, given the Me Too world, you're intimidated by a more intimate conversation. You can't accept that. Don't do that. Say, I need to go on a trip with you. I don't want it to be weird. Tell me what it is you need in terms of engagement, and I'll do it. And I'll tell you why you have to go. I really need you. And you know what? We'll rise up for that. Mm. And we will not let this small, sometimes in our business, small stuff, like Carol said, we should handle ourselves. So that threshold is can you gauge what is not seen, what is not on the table yet, which is my unlimited potential. And the men have to say, I know how to do that. And if they don't, we'll teach you, mm. maybe. But, but, but what is in it? I, you, know, I, you always have to answer that question, what's in it for me? You can't answer that question, you can't make a sale. So what is in it for the men to allow the women at the table? What, what reason do they have for surrounding themselves with people who don't laugh at their jokes, are afraid to laugh at their jokes because you don't know what that's going to lead to, and are not like them? You know, we're not like them. They don't feel comfortable with us. So why should they promote us? Why should they, why should they have a place for us at the table? There has to be something in it for them. They can't do it because it's the right thing to do or because they no. have a wife or a child. They have to do it because they need us. Mm -hmm. We provide something for them that they can't find for themselves. And it's our job to provide to that. that. It's not their job to let us in. It's our job to break down the door. And you do that by giving them something they can't get for themselves. Mm -hmm. And, and, and if we could... Like socks or what? <laughs> just, because we have, like, I always tell the men, get in touch with your female side. You know, you're strong, you're blah, 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 but have some empathy, have some, <laughs> blah, have some collaboration. And, and I remember one time I said to this guy, you're not in touch with your female side at all. And he said, Nina, if I had a female side, I'd be touching it all the time. <laughs> I'm sunk here. I was thinking that case. would be I know, it's like, well, I'm How do we talk to that? Yeah. It was very funny. I laughed very hard. But, but that's the problem is that, you know, we need to fit together. And they, you know, they're not going to have empathy. They're not going to have the female well, traits. They can that, learn. But they're better off if they let us in the room yeah. and then we can have the empathy you know we can be the collab we can collaborate we can do the things that we're good at they can do the things that they're <coughs> good at maybe if we work together long enough we might rub off on each other but it's not up to them to give us an opportunity it's up to us to show them why they need to be with us why we need to be with so them so we have to do both yeah where the rest of you fall out on that and what's your message for men. Yeah. I think Nina is right, but I think it's both. I think they need to um, give us the opportunity. And sometimes if we, um, I, I have to say I've been lucky. You know, I, I, I've been fortunate. I've had terrible male um, uh, bosses, but I've had, for the majority, they've been very supportive. And, and if anything, I think their opposition to my views made me better. Yeah. In other words, yeah. um, 
I, I brought myself to work my whole self. You know, I'm an emotional, caring, nurturing, empathetic human being. Um, and I think that sometimes I just had to work harder at, at improving my intellectual, um, at communicating, let's just say, That's right. my intellectual and analytical side. Mm -hmm. um, I was um, watching a, a documentary about Pauline Kael, uh, the film critic mm -hmm. for The New Yorker. And there was a line in the documentary she's interviewed and she says, you know, men can accept us and forgive us for being emotional and for all that sort of stuff that we do, but they can't forgive us for being analytical and intellectual. They, they sort of are fearful of that. And so I think that we need to, as women, you know, educate them too. Mm. Have them, you know, we need to, 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 to have them open the doors for us. And once they're open, I think it's up to us mm -hmm. to, to. I, I, I would say, I'm beware sorry. killing with kindness. Because I have seen so many situations where men, yeah. because they want to do the right thing, will say, well, this is a great new job and opportunity, but she just had a baby, or sure, her husband has to go somewhere else. And, and so, because they don't want to put women in a situation where they're either going to be uh, conflicted or feel pressure to take an opportunity, will just not offer it at all. And that's the worst thing I that mean, you mm -hmm. could do to a woman, you know, yeah. is just it's sort of... It's her decision. It, yeah. hmm? It's her decision. It's her decision, exactly, exactly. But, I, I mean, I'm sure you've seen it too, is so many times like, uh, yeah, there, there, there's an opening to be the head of the Mexico office, but, gosh, she just had a baby. She's not mm -hmm. going to go to Mexico with a baby. Well, ask her. Right. Maybe she will go to Mexico with a baby. Yeah. Just how do we know? Well, yeah. I think that, you know, this is kind of a difficult question. Uh, in many ways, because I have to say, listen, very. I have been promoted up to the top of a mass market agency twice. I have owned my own agency for X amount of years. I have made a ton of money <laughs> from multiplicity of different clients from Disney to Coors, you name it. And they've all been men. I don't, I have worked with women who work for these corporations, but every contract that I've ever gotten has been awarded to me by a man. Every promotion I have ever gotten has been, uh, given to me by a man, promoted by a man. I like them. <laughs> <laughs> and I, 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 I have worked, I have cursed them out, and they have never cursed me out. <laughs> I have, I'd say they are very, very hardworking, smart people. And I've learned something from everyone that every one of them that I work for. Now, a bunch of them I work for were assholes, <laughs> but I liked them anyway. <laughs> okay, this is a fun business, guys. It's fun, and it's a problem. So I loved it, mm -hmm. and I enjoyed every bit of it, even boxing with. The assholes. <laughs> Which, by the way, should be the title of your next book. Absolutely. <laughs> right? Um, I, I want to pause for a second to just take a couple of quick questions. We don't have a tremendous amount of time, but I know we probably have a lot of audience questions here. So before I ask the panel our last question, does anybody here have anything they'd like to ask? And I think we have some roving mics. Hands, anywhere? Right there? Hi. Um, I'm Simran, and I'm from McCann. I have a question. Um, for someone who is fresh to the industry, what advice would you give to break through and to stand out? Kathy, you do a lot of mentoring, but I know you don't like to call it mentoring. Um, I, I come in early and stay late. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, you'd be amazed at how many opportunities can come because you're the person that is sitting there. 
A newscaster told me one time that in her, one of her first early jobs in Nowheresville, she asked for the night shift because she knew if she got that assignment <clears throat> on the night shift, she'd be the only one in the station. And then she'd be on the front, uh, the, uh, on, on the news, you know, she'd own the story the next day. So I think that a lot of that is you have, you've got to keep your eye on the prize. You know, what's the next? I never thought about being a CEO when I was 24. I mean, it just wasn't in my, under, I mean, it wasn't in my world. But I was always thinking about the next, always thinking about the next. But you've got to do a damn good job on the current job that you have. That is, in fact, what you are being paid for. Anybody else want to take that one? I think find your edge. I mean, whatever that is. In my case, you know, I, I was a Latina. <clears throat> I was in advertising. I took the opportunity to put both things together at a time when no one else was doing it. It was difficult. It was challenging. But I made it my opportunity. So I think you have to find your edge. Mm -hmm. I think and, you and also do the job that nobody else wants. Yes. yes. That's yes. You know, yes. It, it, <coughs> I, I, nobody wanted to write bird's eye radio commercials when I was at YNR. And I'll do it. So I wrote about peas. I wrote about that. And I tried to be funny about vegetables, which is hard. And somebody, you know, took notice of it and gave me an opportunity to do a television commercial because of that yeah. assignment. I think that's the two biggest things, two biggest things. Number one, you know, how, how many of you have seen Hamilton? You want to be in the room. Mm -hmm. You want to be in the room, no matter how late it is or how early it is. You got to be there. Second of all, the stuff that the biggest c campaign I ever wrote, strong enough for a man, made for a woman. When they were going around looking for people to write on that campaign, those guys ran out the room. Everybody, I'm sitting there by myself, <laughs> and my. Carol, would you do this? I'm like, why do they get to work on United and fly to Hawaii and go work on the, you know, me and my RC and all that stuff, and I got to write on secret. Carol, please do this for me. That campaign went from none, took that product from number nine to number one in six months and made my career. You, mm -hmm. you, opportunities happen every day. They sometimes look very strange to you and a little different. Okay, I've got I've got one that's meaner spirited in a way. Oh good. Which is <laughs> you are going to be conned in the first ten years of your life into being the best worker in the room. And you are going to be told that if you work hard and stay late and do all that stuff, you will be promoted. But you won't, honey. <laughs> and the reason you won't be promoted is because there's nothing we like as much as someone who never leaves their desk, never looks up, and just works. So who's going to be inspired to figure out what you can do other than the work? So the whole time you're doing the work, you look for chances to show your relationship side, which Nina describes as seductive. I'm on that. That's fine. <laughs> Whatever it is that is your unique quality, the thing that makes you unique in the world has to be shown early, and you can't settle for being modest, kill that word, and obedient is highly overrated, and in the meantime, make a fuss, learn to kick up a scene, learn to express your emotions, and you will blunder and make a fool of yourself, and this is good, because sooner or later, you'll get the hang of it, and they'll say, don't fool with her. And so you have to watch this tendency to be a good girl. I dislike the word all the time and the emphasis on collaboration. It's an excuse to never get anything done. Let's have collision. And let's have the women create the storm and the fuss and explain why these things don't work because they're intimate and difficult, personal and emotive, and that's what's going to make something happen. So watch out for that work thing. Bravo. Other, is there, uh, there's a question over here. Hi, I'm Jessica Smith. I was a scholarship recipient of New York Women in Communications last year. Um, and I just had a question in terms of like women's support and women in the advertising industry. Uh, Shelly, you mentioned like helping out Charlotte earlier, kind of like being these women together. I just was hoping that you could, could touch upon a time where maybe you helped a woman below you or a woman possibly above you has helped you out in this industry and what that meant for you. Mm. Well, I already did mine. Yeah, right. yeah she's <laughs> on record. Anybody else? Thank you. I never worked for a woman. I, I, and I am not proud of that, and I'm not happy about that, because uh, I think I missed something. I remember, you know, we were all been the only woman in the room. When that happened to me, the first year I went, 
I'm the only woman in the room. I am really special. And then the second year, it started to get not such a good thing. I didn't like being the only woman in the world. And by the, th by the third year, I was still the only woman in the room, and I stopped going to the room. You know, I just stopped going to those meetings, and I thought, oh, but, you know, it was me and the translator were the only two women in, in these big, big board meetings, these global board meetings. And I, it's changed a lot now because, you know, you've changed a lot, Debbie. And I think that there are a lot of women who, aside from us, who are growing up in this business, who are not sitting at the kids' table anymore. They're sitting at the grown-up table, and I'm very proud of the fact that that's happening. But it didn't happen when I was working. And I don't know that I did that much to change it. I, I think if I had to do it over again, maybe I would work a little harder to get more women yeah. in, in you I know, think when I was position. I was the ad director of Ms. Uh, in, its, in its earliest days. And we thought naively in the beginning that we would find the woman on the client side or the agency side that would be so thrilled at this new, quite radical at the time, feminist yeah. magazine coming out. Gloria Steinem was the editor-in-chief and Pat Carbine was the publisher. Right. But we found then, for reasons that we began to understand better, the woman then, let's just say she was, I don't even think we call them marketing directors, but probably the advertising director on the mm -hmm. client side, she was very proud to be the only woman in the room. Mm. And she certainly, I mean, she knew she was paid less than the guys, probably had less authority, but she wanted nothing to do with anything in the least bit that spoke of feminist. Mm. It was like, ugh, a dirty word. And so then we started getting a whole bunch of different people because we thought we're never gonna get anywhere with these really well-known women who didn't want anything to do. Mm. But then as we, began to mature and understand where they were coming from, which is they'd worked twice as hard as anybody else, they still made less than the guys, and they didn't want to damage their career by getting associated with something that was considered pretty radical mm. um, at the time. Mm. Which think, was a, I'm sorry. No, that's right. I think that uh, you have to be very smart about the only woman in the room, especially if she enjoys being the only woman mm -hmm. in the room, because it's just like a checkerboard there. Mm. There's positions for just women. And so then they become very competitive against one another, and it's a problem. Like I said before, I never worked for a woman, but more women work for me than men. And so what happens when you ascend to the top, you must always remember to send that elevator back down. Mm. Love that. Yep. Um, I am afraid we are almost out of time, so I, I would love to just close by asking everybody on the panel, you know, you've got this great audience here of male allies, as we've discussed, thank you, and young women who are really the future of this industry. What is the one thing that you want them to walk out of this room thinking and doing and knowing? Shelley, I'm starting uh, with you. I, I, I just... Uh... I think, not, not to sound um, naive and Pollyanna-ish, but uh, I, I just think we're in a great industry. I mean, I, I've had so much fun. I've had um, such interesting opportunities. I think we spend a lot of time thinking about all the obstacles. Mm -hmm. I think we need to spend more time thinking about all the opportunities and everything that uh, we, we've gotten to do. This is not the time for people who are uncomfortable with, with ambiguity or complexity. If, if you're uncomfortable with that, uh, I, now's the time to exit. But I think if you can embrace that and just say this industry is changing wildly you know, as we watch it, it's so interesting. It's, there, there's so much to be done uh, that I, I just think we should take a moment and just feel grateful that we're in a place where there is so much going on, where the people are so interesting, uh, and every day is certainly an adventure. Uh, okay. I think when we, when we got into the corporate world, you know, we were very independent. We accepted that there was a world that was a boys, you know, a men's club, and that we had to sort of find our ways. As Shelley said, I think we're, we're seeing that change. I think it's, uh, you know, it's more diverse, it's more inclusive, and I, uh, you know, again, I don't want to repeat what, what Shelley is saying, but 
I think the opportunities are there. I think you have to, um, you have to want it. You have to love this business. You have to love what this is about. All of the changes, all of the constant learning, and um, be passionate, love it, and be and, and persevere. I, you know, I I will add one thing that um, years ago, you know, you would mentor someone or you would say to someone. Uh, this is what you should do. You should, um, you know, be authentic. Uh, you know, how do you mentor someone? Has it changed? I think mm -hmm. it's one of the discussions that we that we had, and I think some of it stays the same. Some is the same, but I do think in this world of technology, if I could just appeal to the young people that you know, a little human connection uh, <laughs> for a business that's about storytelling um, does help, and I think. We have a saying in Spanish, hablando se entiende la gente. When you speak with someone, when you converse, you begin to understand them. And sometimes I think that just look what's happening with our president and the tweets. So um, again. Yes. I, I, so have fun. Make personal contact. What would you add, Carol? Well, all of that, but I think, you know, what is the, it's best been said by the world's greatest philosopher, philosopher that I love, absolutely great, Winnie the Pooh. <laughs> what did Winnie say? Ladies, he didn't say ladies, but I'm saying it. <laughs> You're braver than you believe, stronger than you seem, and smarter than you know. Come on in. Cool. <laughs> Not fair. Uh, when I, I was when I was in the State Department, I attended. A, um, I was Under Secretary of State for Public Diplomacy, and some of our money went into the university in Morocco. And there were three beautiful women, like birds, they were so lovely, who had just gotten a master's degree. And as we were celebrating this, and what I saw is their endless potential, they turned me aside, away from the group and the reporters, and said, Madam Secretary, you do understand we will never, ever have a chance to work. Because in our country, the men don't have enough jobs and we'll be second. So one of the things I hope we hold is that it is such a privilege to work, to test yourself, to throw yourself in there, to put it against it. One of the things I see in women that is a real different thing from men. Men have had a genetic code, I've got to work. And they take it differently. We, can, we do feel lo in love with our work against all odds and against logic and sometimes against progress. We still are in love with the privilege of working. So when you get up there and you make some progress, there's one other aspect. Uh, you got there because you have a kind of steely intestinal fortitude. You know you did. You don't get there unless you have it. When you get there, put that down and take up generosity. And generosity is like the secret ingredient of leadership. If you're going to have people follow you, they have to feel connected to your belief in them. And then that'll be all you need, honey. <laughs> I mean, I, I, I think it, if, you, if you take nothing away from this, you'll realize that this business is not for the faint of heart. You really have to be strong. And the most difficult thing that I had to do in this business wasn't writing, coming up with ideas, hiring good people, selling good work. It was relationships. Mm. It was having the relationship with the people in the office so we could all be rowing in the same direction, getting people to work together, getting them to accept each other. You know, if you do, you know, study relationships. You know, if you hate somebody, not one person in particular who I'm thinking I could never like, but <laughs> if, you, if you don't like somebody, find something about that person that you could like. I had a horrible client, but he saved a cat once. And I went, every time he would do something horrible, I'd go, well, he saved that damn cat, so there must be something good about him. Find something that you can love, yeah. because if you don't like somebody, They'll know it immediately. They may know not, you know, men may not be as intuitive as we like them to be, but they always know when you don't like them. They do. Mm. And so you got to be careful about that. <laughs> Figure that out. <laughs> Kathy, one thing you want people to know. You know, when I got out of college, I wanted to be in something creative. Advertising, public relations, 
magazines. And to this day, I've always said that when you're in a business of ideas, no matter whether on air or in print or wherever, you are dealing with people who are interesting. I think our industries, broadly defined, attract really smart, interesting people because they are about ideas. Mm -hmm. And I think that's one of the great things that we can be incredibly proud of. Not about male or female, it's just about mm -hmm. that's the way our, the brains are wired. Mm -hmm. And it's very fulfilling. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, I want to remind everybody that there is a cocktail hour immediately following, and I believe our panelists will be sticking around so you'll have a chance to talk to them um, then, but in the meantime, please join me in a round of applause for our incredible panelists.